My name is Jim Jasper, and this is my studio in Norfolk, Connecticut. This is the upstairs studio, which is kind of the, the clean room. Downstairs, there's a dark room and a, a room where there's paint and ink and things that should be isolated. Uh, but here's where I do some thinking, some drawing. I have my etching press here. And uh, it's good to have, you would think an etching press would go not in the clean room, but I do all the inking and everything downstairs. And when you're making an addition, even a small addition of prints, you want to keep everything pretty clean, pretty immaculate. So it helps me to split those activities up. This is my other press, in a sense. This is an Epson inkjet printer, which I use for drawing. Actually, I do a lot of drawing on this tablet. <clears throat> it's terrific to be able to, a lot of the work, for a lot of my work, I look at the source material. So when I was working on uh, a set of illustrations for Moby Dick recently, I went and took photographs in uh, libraries, either of Melville's collection, books that Melville would have had in his collection, engravings that he referred to. And I went to the Whaling Museum in um, New Bedford to look at their old, uh, their collection of old journals, sailors and captains' journals and logs, which are lavishly illustrated and, and beautiful. But on a tool like this, you can have all that stuff in hand, as well as a copy of Moby Dick and a pencil and a camera, it's really kind of unbelievable. So I think what this sort of used to be, this is now, and what an etching needle used to be, you know, this is now. Although I'm not, I'm not really saying I prefer one set of tools to the other. I'm trying to use both the old ones and, and the new ones. Anything I can get my hands on. Is there anything particular to the, the, the type of subject or, or work that might make you pick one over the other? Yeah, uh, some of the work that I do that's really based on memory or uh, observation exclusively is uh, often a kind of work where I'll just approach it with the old tools only, you know, so I'll start drawing on an etching plate or working on canvas without uh, any sort of modern tools. But typically the work that, uh, if, there, if, there's a, if there's some research involved in it, a lot of the work that I do, uh, for instance, is lately is about books, books that have been important to me. So I referenced working on Moby Dick and, and the materials that were important to that. I'm, I'm working on a set of drawings now for uh, Dante's comedy. I did a set of 34 drawings for the Inferno a couple of years ago, a few years back, and uh, decided to, to go on, but also to start over and do the a full set of 100 drawings for one for each canto of the, of the, of the work. Uh, I'll show you those downstairs. They're, they're in the messy room. So, that's okay. They're, I assume you'll have these guys. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was saying, they're in the messy room, they're in the inferno, we're in the paradiso, <laughs> and right. we'll go through Purgatorio to get there. Um, oh, uh, you could say that. <laughs> <laughs> Can you show us how, how, the, how, the, how the press works? I can. I don't have any plates here, but I often work in, in color with etchings. I have been working on a series of etchings for, for a long time, and I do them it's almost like a, a warm-up when I'm, when I'm thinking about other projects or between other projects. And in order to do multicolor, etchings, you need to register the plate pretty carefully, and the paper, so you know when you take the, 
the first plate off, which might be blue, and you put the second one, which might be burnt umber, that they're in the same spot. So this is a grid from where you are. You can probably see it better over there. This press is sliding back and forth pretty easily because it's not tight. So it would be tightened up using these. And then the plate goes down. The paper, which is dampened, uh, but not wet, so that it's soft. And then these three felts don't look like they would be important, but they're probably the most important part because they evenly distribute the pressure of this big steel roller through the, through the grooves that you've made in the etching plate and the moist paper then absorbs the ink and catches it in its fibers. So um, to do multiple impressions with the same plate, you have to kind of figure out a way to trap the paper so that it doesn't move, and then put the second plate down exactly where the first plate would be. And then it's turned, you know, you just turn it like this, but right now it turns very easily, but when this is at full, when this is exerting full pressure, it's really more kind of like a, a hand over hand thing to pull that through. Because there's, because this isn't contacting the bed, the bed isn't moving, but it would normally move as I, as I turn this. There's a funny story behind this press. I, I've been looking for a used press for years. Etching presses are expensive. And uh, finally, on Craigslist, I saw a guy who had one in Soho. And I went over to look at it, bought it on the spot, and thought, OK. He said, you're taking it with you, right? <laughs> well. Every single component of this must weigh 300 pounds. I mean, the thing is, is very heavy. I'm exaggerating slightly, but when you put it all together, it's not the kind of thing that you can put on your back and carry down six flights in a Soho loft building. Those long <laughs> vertical stairs that just go this far, and then there's a little landing, and then all the way down the street. So I took it apart as much as I could, and uh, put it in my, in my Volkswagen and, and drove it up here and put it back together. And in so doing, I learned a lot about how etching presses work. <laughs> if it ever breaks, which I hope it never will, I'll, uh, I'll know how to address it. But it's, I do know how to point it and do that sort of thing. I think it'll last forever. Are those boxes of paper behind it? Yeah, this is my paper collection. A lot of my work is on paper. Almost all, really. And, uh, let's see, open a more interesting box. This, uh, this is the paper I'm using for the, uh, the comedy drawings. And these were the tests, you know, that. Was it going to be this gray, or this gray, or this gray? You know, there's a big assortment. You, you, you probably can, can see that there's subtle differences in the color, but even more because they're all from different manufacturers, there's a difference in the way they would absorb a pen line, or a watercolor, or a pencil. And since I use all of those things, it kind of, can be kind of hard to find a, a paper that works well. For watercolor, you kind of want it to absorb in a certain way with a certain tooth and, and, and kind of either show off the, 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 the grain of the paper maybe in a certain way. But for ink, you want a, a good stiff line that doesn't bleed. So somehow, uh, by tri trial and error, I suppose different inks behave differently too. I, I found a combination and it works and the color works. And it's called Stonehenge Steel, the paper steel bread that I decided on. But all these other boxes are full of paper that I've 
used or tested for other projects. And vendors of, of paper sell uh, often sample boxes or sample books, and I've been collecting those for years. I, I keep those uh, up on the third floor where I sleep because it's often in the middle of the night that I think, hmm, <laughs> I have a new project in mind. And for me, the first step is to choose the paper. That gets me, it feels like that's half the battle sometimes. So uh, this is the messy room. It's the wet room where I paint. Mostly my paintings are on paper, so they're mostly not, the, the media aren't that messy. Ink and watercolor and pencil. Uh, these are the drawings that I refer to upstairs, the drawings for the comedy of Dante. And I had done a set of 34 drawings for the Inferno. The Inferno has 34 cantos, and the other two books each have 33. The other two canticles would be the correct term. Uh, anyway, because I'd done the Inferno drawings already, I thought when doing the uh, the full 100, that rather than start at 1 and end up at 100, I would do the matching cantos. So the ones, this is Inferno, Purgatory, Paradise, 1, 2, and so on, across the line. And I thought the reason, the reason I wanted to do that is because the people who study Dante have found that vertical readings provides a pretty fruitful way of understanding the text. And they, they certainly were, it certainly was intentioned by, intended by, by uh, Dante to, to write the book in, in a kind of a structure that was thought, that, that, that was, a, he, he determined it to that extent. It was that, well, thought out and of course in that precise and and so what I'm trying to do is kind of uncover a little bit of that myself. Uh, I'm also using symbolism consistently to try to make uh, a, sort of a, a rhythm that happens when, when you look at the drawing so that there are things that are happening across the range that resonate with each other as happens in in the comedy itself. So for instance, this is the this is if you read the the sixes vertically, there's an eagle in in each of those cantos. And uh, the eagle is a symbol there's multiple meanings, but it's it's a it's a symbol of uh, imperial Rome, imperial power, and Dante was very pro-empire, very pro-Rome, very pro-central political power. He thought that it was only a, a central political power like, like that of Rome that could spread and defend uh, Christianity. That was his interest in it. And he thought that the seed of that started with uh, Virgil's hero, Aeneas, who founded uh, Rome. So uh, founded Italy, the, the Roman the Empire. So uh, Virgil, of course, is, is Dante's guide through, through the first two books, the first two canticles. Anyway, uh, I, I also try to use repeated imagery just in, in, in the sense that for my drawings, if, if not in Dante, that I, I, I would like the set of 100 drawings to hang together. So the, you'll notice the eagle is always the same eagle. The angel wings are always the same angel. Here they're uh, opening the city of, of Dis, which is got, guarded by the Medusa. Uh, here, the angel powers the boat that brings the, uh, 
the, the sinners to, to purgatory. Here, the same basic shape is used, it's, it's a metaphor where, the, the, where fish are, the souls, which are insubstantial, are kind of swarming around in a point of light in the, in the paradise. The, the gaps you see are, are the drawings that I'm still resolving, and in fact all of them are, may look completely different, or be torn up, or uh, replaced in one way or another. Next week, <laughs> I, it, this is very early stages. It looks like I'm a little, if, if this is a race, it looks like paradise is winning which surprises me to see. I just hung them up today to have something to show you all, and I didn't think I'd be able to make illustrations for Paradise. It's a very tough book to read, and the concepts in it are very hard to understand, and it really is a lot of colored light and voices and movement and theory and not much like you know, Inferno is full of monsters and pits and uh, demons and sinners and everything in it is very, the people are, are more corporeal and the, there's architecture. Even in, in purgatory there are terraces and, and the people seem less substantial than they do in the Inferno, but by the time you get to the paradise, the only, the people in these drawings are, are not, not people actually acting in the space, in the real space, in the, in paradise, but they're, they're recounting their, their stories about what happened to them on earth. Uh, so, although this is Venus, because we're entering here, the, uh, the planetary sphere of, of Venus. Yes, the paradise is weird, but it's very, very, very beautiful. And I think well worth reading, if, if not drawing, although I'd like to see someone else draw it. A lot, of, a lot more people have done, a lot more people have read The Inferno, and a lot more drawing cycles have been done for The Inferno than for the other two. And I don't know of too many artists who've tried to do a hundred drawings. William Blake did. He was commissioned to do it. But he died uh, before he finished. And there's a really poignant letter from him to his, his friend and, and dealer um, saying, you know, I, I can't do the engravings that you commissioned because I'm in bed. I'm ill and I'm in bed, but I am going on with the drawings and I please myself. In other words, he couldn't, he couldn't stop doing it. <laughs> he wanted to keep going even though, he was, even though he was dying. I'm sure he didn't know he was dying. Maybe he did. He saw angels and knew a lot of things. He was a remarkable person. Uh, but anyway, the, the, the drawings that we do have from, from, uh, from Blake are phenomenal. And I suppose mine are not at all similar in any way, but I hope they are very respectful of and, and certainly are informed by his drawings. This one, this is the drawing of, of uh, Paolo and Francesca, who are in the, the circle of lust. They're not in hell. They're not in the city of the really bad part of hell yet. Uh, they're still sort of almost on the outskirts or in the suburbs of hell, you might say, because they're being punished for a sin of, of lust. The sins, those kinds of sins of excess or sins, sins of the flesh are, are, are punished differently and are taken a little bit more lightly. Not that there's any hope of getting out of hell ever. Uh, this is gluttony here.
uh, greed and avarice pushing at each other in opposite directions. But anyway, the, 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 there are many, many drawings. There's a long tradition of drawings of Paolo and Francesca because it was the, probably the most popular. One or two of the, of the books in the, of the Cantos of the Inferno are, have been very, very popular. And, and uh, a lot of people have done very similar illustrations. So I, I did sort of borrow heavily from, from those, but the basic ingredients are Paolo and Francesca being buffeted by the, the winds, unable to escape their, their lust, uh, and not sure that they want to, honestly. <laughs> they are still pretty into each other, and uh, Dante uh, faints when, after Francesca tells him her story. He faints several times. Uh, he, he's, he's fainted here too. And once again, I'm, I'm doing that, that thing that I told you about. I'm, I'm trying to use the same image to make it the symbol of Dante fainting as well as Dante fainting, because of course it is a symbol of something. You never know quite exactly what, and it's probably many things in the text. Any questions? Can you talk about your um, the the evolution that I imagine that you must have gone through from your first reading of the, the comedy to yeah. imagining these images and, and 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 sort of seeing the story and reading the story as you first read it and then as you saw it in terms of these images. I read the I read the Inferno in college, and I never went beyond it. And maybe five years ago, uh, Mark Scarborough gave a class, an adult adult learning class somewhere around here, in the three books. And I think Norfolk people know Mark Scarborough because he runs the book group, and he lives in Colebrook, and uh, the book group at the library, I should say. And his, uh, his lectures covered the, 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 the full comedy. And one of the things he did was to bring in slides of artworks and music, uh, played music, and it was just marvelous. Uh, one thing that he showed us was the Rauschenberg illustrations for the Inferno. And somehow, when I saw those, I thought, yeah, that I see that, I saw that that line of people doing illustrations for this text had been going on for, well, over 700 years. And I thought, well, that that's a challenge. <laughs> that's something, but not just a challenge, but it's like, at a certain point, it's like being part of a conversation. You know, when you read a book, you feel like you're in conversation with the author, in a way. And when you do a drawing of something that other people have drawn, you're in a conversation with them. So there are lots of references in these books to, in these drawings, to other people's artwork. This is a silhouette of the Emperor Justinian from the, the mosaics in Ravenna. Uh, this is a, oh, I can't even remember right now who did the original drawing, but the crazy Baron von Gelodens posed a, a boy in Sicily to, to match. And did, a, and did a photograph, uh, which I looked at to make that drawing. Um, and there are, there, there are and, and will be more references to, to other people's artwork in these. So yeah, that's, that's really, that was my, my reason for doing it. Generally, I, 
I love making drawings for a book that's a, that I'm reading or that I'm, I guess studying would be a better word, and, and it causes me to read in a different way, more slowly, more times. I'll read criticism and contemporary reactions and really try to know everything about the, the world that the, the person who wrote the book was in. And uh, I, I, find it, I find it both aspects very rewarding, the reading and the drawing. And I don't think they're all that separate from each other. I think, I think the drawings help me read, the readings help me draw, and it's almost like my notes for the book. It will help me if I do these drawings to go back and and see what what the book meant and at least what it meant to me at the time at the time that I read it. And everything in in the whole work is just so precisely tied together, well researched. I mean, uh, in addition to all these kind of micro stories that are represented here, of uh, the, the people that, or souls that, that, that Dante encounters along the way, there's also the structure of the the whole universe and you're never allowed to forget what time of day it is, how much time has passed, where you are geographically. If you're on, in, on Mount Purgatory, you're exactly at the antipodes of, of uh, Jerusalem. And so what the, what's happening in the stars you know, the, the movement of the sun, all of it is determined in such a way that you could actually construct a world. You could, if you were, I don't know what you'd have to be to do it, probably a video game designer or something, I don't know, but you could do it. You could, you could reconstruct the whole thing and have the, I mean, the whole story takes place in, in just like, several days, you know. Isn't that long a time period? Yeah, it's a very, yeah, you, you could, you, I think you could read the, you could read that book forever and never, and never mind it completely. And so much of it is, is um, like the stuff of dreams. It's, it's, it's yeah. the, the, the fears and, and, and the things that, you know, that burn deep inside your soul and then some little something will suggest something that will make you, you know, make some connection in a dream and, and yeah, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's an, an, he had an incredible, incredible mind, incredible control to do that. A lot of it is very unclear. You know, it could be interpreted one way or another, and there are some things that nobody understands. Nobody's ever claimed to understand the people today. And you wonder why that would have been. But some someday somebody might figure some more of it out. People are always <laughs> making progress on it. It started being it started being a subject of lectures. The first person to really do lectures was Boccaccio, and he did them. Uh, I think starting the, the work is set in 1300 
around Easter weekend of 1300. And of course it would have been published. Published? It was all manuscripts, so published is not really the word, but it would have been available to some people, you know, handwritten copies. We have Boccaccio's copy, he illustrated it himself. Um, anyway, Boccaccio started doing lectures in, like, in 1350 or 60, and he's the one who started calling it the Divine Comedy. Dante didn't do that, he just called it the Comedy. Because it, it works out well at the end, not because it's ha ah, funny, right, right. unfortunately. There are, there are funny parts, but many. Right. <laughs> Unless you have a very different sense of humor than I do. <laughs> the Aristotelian comment. Yeah, yeah, that's right. If you, if you think uh, debates about free will are funny. <laughs> Last chance. You want to think of anything? Oh, else? I, I mean, uh, what do you imagine um, the 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 life of these pieces will be? Do you, um, do you, do you see them in a in a library, a gallery? Uh? Yeah, it's a good question, and it's a question that's very tough because the the, the opportunities to show them all at once will be limited because they take up some room, right? So it's, it's, uh, I, I, I like the idea of having 100 of them on a wall like this. It gets tricky because there's an extra one. In the first book, there's 34, and then in the first canticle, 34, and then 33 and 33. So there's one hanging off the edge <laughs> of the bottom row. Um, but it's more the real reason it's tricky is because this is nine, so that in order to hang on one wall, you'd have to have a wall that was, you know, and hang them in a better way than this. This is kind of stupid. They're all really close together, but you'd have to have them, um, you'd have to have a wall six times this, the length of this wall. Well, I suppose that can happen. Um, so I don't know how much of a life they'll have in, in galleries. And right now, not, nothing <laughs> is that much of a life in galleries. So I'm thinking that I will either photograph them when they're done, or maybe do something with the drawings that I do on the iPad and make kind of an electronic version of the whole thing, and then turn that into something between a, a catalog and a book. Like, I, I don't think there's any reason to combine these with the full text. Mm -hmm. But enough of it, and enough of maybe something about my thinking to make it intelligible to people. Because I think that if people did have access to something that they could, if they were reading the text and then they could look at drawings and, and, and say, oh yeah, this is what's, you know, this is like the cliff notes of this chapter, and this is what the artist was thinking. That could be sort of interesting to people, I think. So I'm, in, I'm trying to do that with the Moby Dick drawings now, because they're finished. But there's more of those. There's 144 of them. Don't take a, take a while to do all that writing. I'd like to have them out in the world, though, in, in one way or another. I think a, a, a library would be sort of perfect, you know, maybe to, I don't know, just um, 
and, and not necessarily in a clump, but more as in like as a as, as, as a journey. Uh, yeah. Yeah, maybe. If you go to the British Art Center in New Haven, you can look at Blake's books, hmm. and he did. He actually did things like this and bound them into a book. I am, as you can see, making them all horizontal. So that makes it easier to do something like a book. The Moby Dick, some of them are vertical, some are horizontal, and it makes it a problem. I think I kind of learned my lesson there. But, you know, I started out doing these as vertical drawings, but they were just too iconic. You know, like it was always like a central figure. It's nice to be able to do things like this, you know, like to have some some space here and there. It shows a progression. It makes it, it's more. I think that maybe the horizontal is more appropriate for narrative for narrative like this. It's a special size too, you know, it's an unusual size, this paper. It's kind of a, a narrow rectangle. It's because it's a, it's a, the golden section rectangle, which artists started using probably not in Dante's time, but not long after artists like Piero della Francesca would it, you know, they would have systems of geometry in their paintings that determine perspective and the placement of figures. Monet did it too. You look at Monet's and you think they're all just a response to light and color, but no, they were very, um, many of them, very, very worked out geometrically. Uh, and these are too, in in deference to those artists that I love and and to that way of thinking which I love that there's that, that you know there's ultimately no reason to be doing any of this so if there's some kind of a system like that it feels like oh maybe it's a crutch but I, I feel like it, it 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 also has some meaning even though it's kind of invisible but it's a beautiful proportion, and it's a proportion that's used that that you that you find in nature. You know about it, I'm mm. sure. Oh, yeah. If you take the square of the paper, you know the, where the that would be the same. That what's left over has the same proportion as the original. And things like the, the Nautilus are, the Nautilus shell, you can, if you do that, and then you do it again, and then you do it again, you know, you, you can lock well, the corners and you make a Nautilus spiral. Can you get your, get your Fibonacci series? It is very similar to the Fibonacci series. The Fibonacci series just is uh, whole numbers, and this isn't. So it's the Fibonacci series is less, uh, precise. So these are the closest I could come given the, you know, not wanting to waste too much paper and the sheet size the paper comes in and then the fact that when you're tearing these down by hand, you're not going to really be precise, but the closest I could come was what is it, nine inches by nine and three quarters by 15 inches, approximately. <laughs> That's pretty close. I had a whole bunch of paper cut exactly to the right size. I did. And then I decided it was not dark enough and the light wasn't showing enough. So I have to do something else with that. I don't know what. I'll figure it out. It's never a problem to have too much paper. 
it's what I hoarded it. When everybody else was out buying t toilet paper, I was on the phone with Talis Art Supplies <laughs> <laughs> all through March, having them keep sending me <laughs> big stacks of paper. <laughs> yeah, I figure if I get stuck, I want to keep drawing at least. Tell us something about the, the 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 materials, the process, the your your palette. The yeah, I um, for this set of drawings, I decided that since there were going to be so many of them, I wanted to limit the palette, and I chose eight colors. Uh, well, white, black, and I think there were eight, but there's seven little swatches there. Maybe there are only seven. And some of the colors aren't really colors. Like this color is called Caput Mortem, and if you see it, it's got, it's both blue and red at the same time. It's a strange color. I haven't used it yet, but I'm thinking it will be kind of great in parts of hell. It's a hellish name, too. <laughs> and then this is um, this is a new color. It's a it's a it's a it's a mineral, and one of the watercolor uh, houses has discarded. It's very grainy. I love that it's very grainy, and it um, it sparkles, and it's kind of blue, but. It depends a little bit on what color you might layer it with. So, but it's the color that I'm using here and here. I like using gold for this. I I generally like using gold in, in work. I think it it just does something. It, it's it's a it's a color that's such a powerful symbol. It means it always means something other than just its meaning as a color, which I like. Uh, but there isn't, you know, it's mostly it's mostly ink, ink washes, and white. Uh, I, I started looking for the gray papers. I was talking about that upstairs because white has to show as a color on these. And it's important that the paper not have too much of a color so that in a drawing like this, the negative space reads as, as white, not gray. But that in a drawing like this, you can see that there is white and that it's something else. It's not, it's not just the background of the color. Of the, of, the, of the work. So the colors do have uh, symbolic meanings. In medieval art, the symbolic meanings were very important. And I am not trying to re, uh, recapture a, you know medieval symbolism, but sometimes maybe a little bit. This color, this kind of cerulean blue, was was associated with heaven, and uh, so here the, the blue. This is the blue of Saint Lucy's eyes. So it's not a it's not a complete system, a, a complete system of color symbols, but there, there's, there's that very definitely some of that. So, yeah, the limited palette is, includes the gold, the white, the black, those colors. For the gold, I use this stuff. It's a 
some fantastic watercolor. I think it's German. Yeah. Coliro M600. I'm not sure how I found it. Because you can find anything online. And this is the Inferno Gold. This was the Moby Dick Gold. I haven't really used very much of any of the other ones. <laughs> But yeah, the gold, gold is a marvelous thing, this, this gold watercolor, and watercolor in general, because it's transparent, the layering can be very intense and, and, and rewarding, and you can get unexpected results if you, if you allow yourself to have a little freedom with it. This one, for instance, the way that this bluish stuff works over a black ground versus over the white, the, the pure paper is quite different. So it adds a lot of dimension. I do layer these quite a bit. I, I work pretty wet with the ink and the paint, so I, I start and then I wait, things dry, and add, and do it again. And so I work pretty quickly on them, but it still takes forever. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. I, I, there's nothing I enjoy doing more, so if it takes forever, bring it on. <laughs> to make sure I try to last forever. That's less clear. <laughs> Just don't follow in Blake's footsteps. Yeah, I'm not. I'm trying not to let this kill me like it did Blake. Boy, that might turn into a superstition, though. <laughs> Never try to draw the uh, divine comedy.